Hey, welcome back to Intermediate Accounting, where we are all about uncollectible AR in our video right now. We're going to talk about how to handle it from an accounting standpoint when you extend credit to a customer and they just don't pay you back. We'll give you all the details coming right up. So uncollectible AR is unfortunately a thing we have to deal with in the accounting world and in a perfect world where everything is rosy and good, uh, we could extend credit and people would always pay us back. You know, Mattel could uh, sell a, a thousand Barbie dolls to Toys R Us, extending them credit, and Toys R Us would pay off that account receivable within 30 days and everything would be perfect. We don't live in a hypothetical perfect world, do we? We live in the real world. And we know that sometimes when Mattel sells a bunch of toys to a place like Toys R Us, Toys R Us ends up going out of business. Oh no, now they can't pay off that account receivable anymore. So we call that in business credit risk. You have a risk when we extend credit to someone that they may not be able to pay off that debt. They may not be able to pay off their account receivable. The problem is we don't know ahead of time who's going to pay and who's not. If we had that information, we wouldn't sell to the person that wouldn't pay us back to begin with, right? If we had a crystal ball, it could, it could predict that. So why are we left? What do we do then when a customer just won't pay? Well, we could round up the mob and the mafia and send them off to the customer and maybe help grease the skids a little bit to get our money back. We could do that. Uh, we could do like this lovely lady here. Uh, this lady went into a spectrum demanding her money back. When they refused, she got a crowbar and literally jimmied open the register and just took the money. Now, we're not going to do that. We are peace-loving accountants. We like to settle things from an accounting standpoint and let everybody else handle the other stuff. So we need to talk about, as a peace-loving accountant, how do we handle it from an accounting standpoint when that customer won't or can't or doesn't pay off their AR balance? So let's look at the financial statements here. I got a couple of balance sheets for you. I got Mattel up here in their consolidated balance sheet. You can notice under current assets, AR, and it says net of allowances for credit losses of 10.7 million and 15.9 million. What's that all about? That is reporting AR at something called net realizable value, NRV, the amount that Mattel expects to collect on their account receivable. We can see they have, this is in thousands, so about 1 billion in account receivable, and that's net of a $10 million amount that they don't expect to collect. Uh, Mattel, uh, toy company, uh, somebody really phoned it in uh, when they made the logo for the Mattel company there. As I look at that, I was eating Halloween candy before the video. Uh, the Mattel logo looks like somebody basically just took a Reese cup and a uh, miniature Reese cup and just kind of colored it red and wrote Mattel inside of it. So Mattel, do better. Keep, according, uh, keep recording your accounts receivable correctly, but do better on the logo front. It's not just a Mattel fund. Hasbro, another example here on their balance sheet, you'll see accounts receivable list allowance for credit losses. So all these big companies are reporting the accounts receivable at their net realizable value, the amount they expect to collect. That amount is not the full amount that they originally uh, extended in credit. It's a lower amount because of those parties that will not pay them back. So Recording uncollectible accounts. We kind of have two schools of thought here, or two options. First of all is the allowance method. In the allowance method, we record an estimated amount for the uncollectible accounts in the year of sale. We are proactive. We estimate how much might not be collected and we make entries for it. The other kind of option here is the direct write-off method. In that methodology, we basically wait until somebody has proven they won't pay and then we write off that one account directly. Maybe it's a bankruptcy, maybe it's uh, gone out of business, maybe it's just been outstanding for so long that we've given up on it, whatever the case might be, we wait until that happens and then we write it off. Now, the allowance method is GAP approved. GAP tells us we should be making an allowance for these doubtful accounts and bad debts as we go along. The direct write-off method is not allowed under GAAP except under very limited circumstances. So for the most part, direct write-off is not an option. Waiting until they prove they can't pay is not an option for GAAP financial accounting. But it is okay and required for tax purposes. 
The IRS tells us we must account for doubtful accounts using the direct write-off method for tax purposes. In other words, we wait until the account is proven to be uncollectible before we can write it off on our taxes. So, financial accounting, what we're concerned with right here in Intermediate, we are going to be focusing on the allowance method. Recording that allowance for uh, the amounts we expect will not get paid as we go along. So the basics. Company, as I mentioned, will estimate the future bad debts that exist in accounts receivable. We base that estimate on all kinds of different things. It could be our past experiences. It could be our credit risk strategy. What kind of customers are we selling to and their credit ratings or credit, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, their credit worthiness. Industry trends. And then also economic conditions. Are we in a bad economy where people are not paying back their debts? Or are we in a good economy where debts are getting repaid? The estimate's based on all of those things. We use that information to make an adjusting entry to record our estimate for future bad debts. The adjusting entry itself is really straightforward. At the end of the period, we debit bad debt expense and we credit an account called allowance for doubtful accounts. That bad debt expense is an expense account normally reported on the income statement as an operating expense. Cost of doing business when we extend credit is that some people won't pay. So that is an operating expense. The allowance for doubtful accounts is a contra asset account. Our old friend contra asset accounts coming back here. It's reported as a subtraction from account receivable as we saw on the Hasbro and Mattel balance sheet. We subtract out the amounts that we expect won't be paid from AR to get a net realizable value. So allowance for doubtful accounts. Sometimes you'll see it also called allowance for bad debt. Contra asset account, not the first contra asset account we've seen. Can you think of another one? Give it a second there. See if, see if another contra asset account comes to mind. Or better yet, shoot me an email and tell me if you can think of any other contra asset accounts. I bet you can because we've studied them before. So the question becomes, well, the entry is pretty straightforward. How in the heck do we come up with the numbers, right? Yeah, this is counting. we got to come up with some kind of number. We just can't leave a bunch of X's in our journal entries. So how do we come up with the number? Estimating the actual bad debt, we have two different options here. Either one is fine. In fact, in most places, use a combination of the two. But our two options that we have, percentage of credit sales and percentage of AR, percentage of accounts receivable. The percentage of the credit sales is an income statement approach. The percentage of accounts receivable is a balance sheet approach. Now, I'm aware that I say that to you right now, and you probably think that means nothing to me, Professor Martin. I don't, whatever. I'm going to tell you what that means. So keep those two little blurbs in mind. Income statement approach, balance sheet approach, because we're going to come back to that. And hopefully when we do, it'll all make perfect sense to you. Let's do an example. Percent of credit sales method. We got Lima Corp. Net credit sales during the year were 500,000. Bad debts are historically 2% of net credit sales. So I mentioned before the different things that we think about to try to come up with an estimate. Historic data, economic trends, industry trends, all of that. In uh, our book, they'll just give you the number. We don't have to think about it. But in reality, that kind of information goes into coming up with that 2% estimate, okay? So bad debts are historically 2% of net credit sales. Lima would make the following end of period entry. Debit bad debt expense, credit allowance for doubtful accounts, just like I showed you in the other entry. Only now we got numbers, 10,000. How'd you get 10,000? Super easy. Net credit sales multiplied by the percent we expect won't be collected, 2%. 500,000 times 2% gives me 10,000. Now, Percent of credit sales is an income statement approach. What that means is we're coming up with the number for bad debt expense. And we're just going to book it. Whatever we calculate, we're going to book it because it's an income statement approach. And we're looking at that relationship between credit sales and bad debt expense. All right. So we would record whatever we calculate. Plug it in there. That's the number for our entry. So, income statement approach. We calculate the bad debt. We ignore whatever's in the allowance for doubtful accounts account. All right? You'll notice 
we recorded an entry to the Allowance for Doubtful Accounts, but we thought nothing, zero, about what was already in that account. Don't care, because we're taking an income statement approach. We're more concerned about recording an amount for bad debt expense. Whatever is in the allowance, who cares? Not our focus. All right, we're ignoring it for now. That brings us to the percentage of accounts receivable, which is a balance sheet approach. Let me do an example. West Corp has determined there is a 5% relationship between actual bad debt and year-end AR. West accounts at the end of the period are AR balance of $475,000 and the allowance for doubtful accounts has a $4,500 credit balance. Here we go. Step one, under the percent of AR method, we need to calculate what should be in the allowance account. Now on the percentage of credit sales, that income statement approach, we didn't care. We completely ignored it, but now we got to think about it because we're calculating what should be in the allowance account. So I have a little T account here, my allowance for doubtful accounts. The problem said we began with 4,500 on the credit side. We want to know, well, what's the ending amount? That's what we're calculating here. We're calculating that ending amount in the allowance for doubtful accounts. 475,000 AR balance multiplied by 5% gives me 23,750. That's the number that's going to be my ending balance. Okay, so I need to get from 4,500 to 23,750 in my adjusting entry. How do I do that? Well, simple. I just subtract one from the other to get my number. 23,750 ending balance minus $4,500 beginning balance means I need to plug in 19,250 in order to get to where I need to be. 4,500 plus 19,250 gives me 23,750. All right. Now, this number won't always be on the credit side for the beginning balance. Sometimes you have a scenario where maybe that number's on the debit side and you got to handle that. But for now, it's on the credit side. So we end up with an adjustment of 19,250. Record the entry after that. We already know the debit, bad debt expense. Credit the allowance for doubtful accounts, 19,250. All right, so really the entry itself doesn't change, but how we're calculating the number is what's different between a percentage of credit sales and percentage of AR approach. Now, I highlighted bad debt expense in the percentage of sales approach. Now we're focused on the allowance for doubtful accounts because we're trying to record an amount that gets us to the correct number in that allowance account. So again, now I'm filling in the blanks here, making it make sense. Income statement approach. We're calculating bad debt expense. That's our focus. We completely ignore that balance in the allowance for doubtful accounts. When we take a balance sheet approach, we're focused on getting that allowance account to the number it needs to be. That's why they call it a balance sheet approach because that number lives on the balance sheet. So exact same entry, two different focuses going on there. So just go back to this idea here. West Corp had determined there's a 5% relationship between actual bad debts and year-end AR. There's actually a better way of calculating uh, the estimated uncollectible amount than kind of lumping it all as a 5% number when we're doing the percentage of AR method. And the reason for that is not all accounts receivable are equal or equally uncollectible. Uh, accounts receivable that are really old are highly uncollectible. Accounts receivable that are brown new aren't nearly as uncollectible. So that 5% number that I have up there just ignored all that. It treated all the accounts receivable the exact same. There's a better way of doing it. And that's called an aging of accounts receivable. This is still a percentage of AR method, but instead of just using a, a flat percent and treating all AR the same, and in an aging, we break it out by category according to how long it's been outstanding. So here we can see we have a, a company and they have a few different customers here and the account receivable balances for every customer. And they've broken it down according to how long the debts have been outstanding. We can see Goodwin Company at the top, 21,000 of their debt is under 60 days outstanding. 60 to 120 days, they have 12,100 outstanding. You look at Hobson, their debt outstanding is over a year. 
So the idea behind an aging is that the company's far less likely to collect that 14500 that's been outstanding for more than a year than an amount that's current. Okay, so they put that into play here. Notice at the bottom, we're calculating the estimated uncollectibles. They've taken every category under 60 days, 60 to 120, 120 to 140, 241 to 360, and over a year, and listed them out. The total amount ties back into the total AR balance. Then they've taken each category and multiplied it by an estimated percent on collectible. Notice under 60 days, it's not a very high percent. When we get over a year, it is a super high percent because the reality is if someone hasn't paid you back within a year, they probably gonna pay you back. It's a 50-50 shot according to the problem here. They multiplied the balance in the category by the estimated percent on collectible and got an uncollectible amount. They totaled them up. That's the allowance balance that they're shooting for under the aging of AR. Instead of just taking 5% times the entire balance, they break it down by category, uh, length of outstanding, and come up with a much better number that is much better at reflecting reality. The practice, I mentioned that some places do both, and that's totally true. They maybe go through the year and every quarter, they use percentage of sales method, and then at the end of the year, they may do an aging of AR to refine that number. Okay, So you need to be familiar with all of that. Writing off an uncollectible account. And again, we're not talking direct write-off method here. We're talking about a scenario where we're doing the allowance method, but we've uh, determined or discovered that a customer just isn't going to pay us back. Maybe they've gone bankrupt, whatever. They're never going to pay. We need to write off that account. The way we do that is we would debit our allowance account and we credit accounts receivable. The credit for accounts receivable takes it out of AR and the debit for allowance for doubtful accounts takes it out of the allowance. We don't need to allow for someone who has proven they won't pay. So really, it's a net wash on our balance sheet. And there's no effect really on the balance sheet from a net perspective. We're just kind of taking a number from one and the other. It just nets out to no effect on the balance sheet. On the allowance for doubtful accounts, though, the debit side and the credit side of every account, of course, the allowance for doubtful accounts is no different. We've already showed you, we put estimated uncollectible accounts to the credit side. The debit side is for known uncollectible accounts. You'll notice here in writing off an uncollectible account, we have a debit. Yeah, when we know someone doesn't pay, that ends up being a debit to the allowance account. The credit side is when we're making the estimate. So that whole account is basically, uh, you know, just for estimates. And we could end up with a scenario where we could end up with a debit balance if we've written off a whole bunch of accounts, or we could have a credit balance. So you just kind of have to pay attention in your problems what side the balance is living on, okay? Again, the credit side is for estimated uncollectible. The debit side is for known uncollectibles. Let's say we write off an account and we have a zombie scenario. We wrote off an account and all of a sudden that account comes back to life and pays us off. We have zombie accounting going on. The way we'd handle that and collect a, a written off account is we'd simply reverse the entry right here where we wrote them off. We debit accounts receivable to put it back to AR and we credit the allowance to put it back in the allowance. And then we'd simply collect it. Cash debit, AR credit. So our takeaways, uncollectible accounts receivable. It's an important topic because we have to make sure our accounts receivable are reported at net realizable value, the amount we expect to collect reasonably. You need to know how to calculate bad debts as a percent of sales, that income statement approach. You need to know how to calculate bad debts as a percentage of receivables, that old balance sheet approach. You also need to be able to use a, an AR aging to record bad debts. Again, another AR approach to that. And then finally, you need to know how to write off on collectible accounts using the allowance method, like I just showed you. So, a lot of information in that video. Hopefully, we laid out the groundwork there for you to be able to do your problems in your problem set. If you run into any issues, I'd be happy to help. You can send me an email and we'll try to tackle those and get you over the hump. Until next time, take care. And we'll see you later on.